All right, welcome everyone. It's uh, six o'clock. This is Kiss Those Sugar Blues Goodbye. I'm Katie Wallace. And uh, if you have any questions, please type it into the chat uh, function on your screen. I'll have time for questions at the end. Um, I am a traditional naturopath located in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm a health educator. I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm presenting these ideas for health education only. All right, tonight we're going to start with talking about the problems that there are with sugar and then some of the underlying imbalances that might lead to cravings or a vicious cycle with carbs and sugars. And then uh, I'll spend the rest of the lecture talking about different ways to address those imbalances with just tips of things you can eat and other lifestyle suggestions. So what you eat is important. I like this uh, excerpt from this journal from 2014. While today's modern diet may provide beneficial protection from micro and macronutrient deficiencies, in other words, we're not in a state any longer where we have a lot of deficiencies from not getting enough food, we actually have an overabundance of food. And this overabundance is leading to increased inflammation, reduced control of infection, increased rates of cancer, and risk for allergic and autoinflammatory disease. And I highlighted the reduced control of infection just to make it relevant to our global pandemic with the coronavirus. I think if there is one dietary change we as individuals can make to improve our immune health and reduce the likelihood of having a severe case of the coronavirus, it is eliminating sugar and excess carbohydrates from the diet. So that's why I was inspired to share this in this series of webinars. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about just exactly what is blood sugar control and you know, uh, cover some groundwork in terms of blood sugar and insulin. So blood sugar control just talks about how our body maintains naturally balance or homeostasis. So the blood sugar level is the same as a blood sugar concentration, or it's also called blood glucose. And it's just the concentration of sugar or glucose, which is a type of sugar that we use to um, shuttle energy around in our bodies in the bloodstream. And this is a picture of a glucometer, uh, which is a, a blood meter to measure your blood sugar. And you can buy one on Amazon and um, you might see diabetics using this. So this can be a helpful tool if you're wanting to know what's happening with your blood sugar levels. But basically, when sugar of any type, whether or not it's processed sugar, natural sugar, sugar broken down from eating a complex carbohydrate or a fruit, when that enters the body, our pancreas releases insulin, which is a hormone. And um, the insulin acts like a key to let the blood sugar into the body's cells. So you need the insulin to get the sugar in so that your cells can use the sugar for energy. But too much insulin causes problems. And some signs that you might be having problems with insulin include having cravings, especially cravings after a meal, or feeling sleepy, or having brain fog, feeling fatigued, or having trouble sleeping. So as we age, our insulin production increases, and um, this can lead to a lot of negative health outcomes. So we can have chronic inflammation from too much insulin. It can trigger our estrogen to increase. Um, it can trigger a number of um, diseases. And so you might consider at some point, if you're suspecting you have issues or just curious, getting a blood test to look at your insulin level or your glucose level and see how you're doing. Uh, the hemoglobin A1C is another marker for blood sugar control. So signs of lost blood sugar control include uh, just lots of cravings. 
okay? Uh, if your blood sugar is going up and down, uh, you might eat a, eat a very satiating meal, but still have trouble, um, you know, wanting something after the meal. Feeling hangry or tired are also uh, common signs of lost blood sugar control. So hangry is when you're really irritable, when it's time to eat. Um, it's like, because your blood sugar is so low, your adrenals start pumping out a lot of cortisol. The job of the hormone cortisol, it's a stress hormone, is to get sugar into your cells. And so some of us are really, really good at making cortisol uh, when our blood sugar's low. And um, that can make us feel more stressed and more irritable. And sometimes when we are under extended stress, our cortisol levels get depleted and we start making other adrenal hormones like um, no epinephrine and epinephrine and adrenaline. And then we're really whacked out when our blood sugar is off and we can be very moody. Um, so if this sounds like you, it may be a sign that you know you need to take some steps to, to work on uh, regaining blood sugar control. And you can do that. You can regain blood sugar control. Um, and I'll give you some tips here later in the talk. Feeling really sleepy after a meal is pretty common when we get too much carbohydrate for us in the meal. So for some people, this will even happen if they eat a salad, if they've really lost blood sugar control. But for most people, this is more like, oh, you ate some pancakes or you ate a sandwich or you know something relatively high or carb um, and then feel really sleepy after the meal because your body wants to store that excess sugar and that takes a lot of energy and makes us tired. Um, so these other, other things are also you know, kind of related to what I've been talking about, um, brain fog, difficulty sleeping, um, if your body is not able to burn fat very well and it just wants to burn carbohydrates because it's on a blood sugar roller coaster, that'll present a lot of sleep difficulties for people, as well as um, problems with fatigue. You know, your body's not really getting the fuel that it really needs. If it's only trying to burn carbohydrates, uh, then that creates a lot of fatigue, um, unless you've just eaten, for example. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the other things here. Let's keep moving. So we wanna avoid this blood sugar roller coaster and uh, the beer and the pastries in the picture, you know, might be obvious things that are high carb that might cause a rise in your blood sugar initially and then a drop, which will make you hungry, you know, usually typically within a few hours after the meal, feeling like you're kind of tied to always having to have a snack with you is a sign that you might have some blood sugar problems. And these stimulants pictured like the coffee and the chocolate um, will also help us temporarily feel good because they stimulate our, um, our endocrine system, but then they actually cause a big plunge later also. So it's just something to be aware of if you know you tend to have blood sugar issues is that you might not stimulants might not be for you or not at this time. So I have a mentor who says that pretty much every modern disease stems from blood sugar problems. And I think for the most part, he's right. Uh, eating foods high in sugar basically cause our blood sugar level to go up. And this slide talks about all the downstream effects. Um, that happen with that and everybody's system basically is affected by this cascade just from eating foods high in sugar. And this becomes more serious as we age. And for all of us, that rate of aging might be a little different, but it's pretty um, standard for most people to experience more problems tolerating sugar and carbohydrates as they age. So when our sugar goes up, something called AGEs increased. And AGE stands for advanced glycation end product. And this is like you're caramelizing uh, proteins and lipids in your body, and this triggers a lot of disease. Triglycerides are what the liver makes when there's excess carbohydrates coming in. It wants to store them as fat. And once AGEs and triglycerides are triggered, 
total cholesterol starts increasing and the small particle LDL, which is more dangerous than large particle LDL, will also increase from the intake of sugar and this whole cascade. And as a result, the protective HDL cholesterol decreases. And for men, testosterone plummets. So sugar is horrible for men, um, horrible for the male libido and for their testosterone levels, which are really important for um, their mental and emotional health. And for women, we typically see estrogen go down. I mean, I'm sorry, estrogen go up and progesterone go down. So women tend to get in an estrogen dominant state, as do men. Basically, as men eat more sugar, they um, become more estrogen dominant and their testosterone lowers. And these have a pretty significant impact for um, other body systems like our brains. Our brains rely on testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. So, um, so this cascade can lead to Alzheimer's, for example. I wanna, uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but I wanted to explain what the AGEs are um, in case you, well, just so that when you see this again, you know what it is. Um, an AGE basically results from too much sugar. So if you eat something high on the glycemic index and um, just checking to see that everybody's doing okay. Nobody sent me a chat, so I'm assuming you're hearing me okay. Um, when you eat something high on the glycemic index, that would be a food like a dried fruit or maybe rice or potatoes, popcorn, something like that. Uh, those sugar molecules can bind to proteins or lipids, and we think that this is one of the ways that uh, diseases develop. It basically induces aging. Um, and inflammation, and a lot of times the body's not equipped to dampen that. Here's a picture of AGEs. So you've got your sugar and your protein combine it, combined to kind of caramelize, um, and you can see here how it um, affects many different body systems, the gene expression, the immune responses, hormones, um, basic metabolism. And then this is just a visual to think about how when the carbohydrate in the diet increases, the triglycerides um, increase. So here we are again, um, just to review, we eat foods high in sugar, it raises our blood sugar, uh, which raises our insulin, which then raises advanced glycation end products and triglycerides. And then we have this cascade of cholesterol, and then that ends up affecting our hormone levels among other things. So with this picture, we often see a lot of other complications, like overall, we're getting too many calories. We may be getting too much omega-6s, which are more from grain and plant-based foods and not enough omega-3s, which are from seafood typically. And this triggers a lot more inflammation. We might be getting in a lot fewer polyphenols, which are the micronutrients from plant foods. Uh, because of the fatigue and the issues, there's probably decreased exercise and more sedentary lifestyle and then reduced fiber. So all of these things, you know, contribute to the development of, of disease. And these are uh, diseases that we know stem from eating foods high in sugar, basically. And here's a paper that talks specifically about breast cancer and how this goes back to blood sugar dysregulation. And this is a great book if you're interested in brain health and um, addressing Alzheimer's or avoiding Alzheimer's. Dale Bredesen is a medical doctor who's wrote this excellent book and he talks a lot about how um, you can support the body nutritionally and, and in other ways um, to, um, to improve cognition. Um, and he also talks about how as our brain ages, our cells in our brain lose the ability to use carbohydrates for fuel. And it's so important to provide fats in the diet so that the brain can get ketones, especially for older brains. So, and one more thing about the sugar that's bad for us um, is it, it suppresses our immune system. So we know from numerous research studies that um, if you have a sugary treat, it suppresses your white blood cells, which are like the, um, 
first defense of your immune system, it, it suppresses them for at least a few hours. So if you're somebody who's having multiple sweets throughout the day, then that's really hitting the immune system hard and will decrease overall immune function. So I talked about how too much sugar can be a problem, but not having enough food can, or having low blood sugar can also be a problem. So for some people, skipping meals creates a lot of problems, or if they wait too long to eat, they're, they're really sabotaging themselves. Um, so intermittent fasting is pretty popular right now. That's an approach where you fast for, you know, 16 to 18 hours overnight and have a smaller feeding window. And it, you can get a lot of health result benefits from doing it, um, but it's not necessarily right for everyone. So um, if you know that skipping meals and waiting too long creates um, a lot of issues for you, then it's probably not a good idea to jump into intermittent fasting with that long of a fasting window. Maybe trying a fasting window of like 12 to 14 hours is more appropriate or even less for some people with low blood sugar um, until that can be improved. And so, you know, I think of a good example of this is looking at young women, like high school girls and how um, they're so concerned about body image that they may not really be eating enough. And this can set up a lifelong issue with hormones because of the deprivation. So it's important not to deprive ourselves. Um, if we have low blood sugar, then when we do eat, it can set up a big blood sugar swing. So we go from low to high. And uh, while we're low, we make a lot more cortisol, which increases our belly fat. So um, actually, for some people, skipping meals really undermines their ability to reduce their belly fat um, or achieve a healthy weight. Um, and it can also create a lot of problems with sleeping uh, because when the stress hormone is created, then we cortisol, then we can't make melatonin at the same time. The two are really inverse. The cortisol suppresses the melatonin. So you can't really get good restoration of your body um, if the eating habits are dysfunctional. Um, also, this bl blood sugar swings can lead to the increased triglyceride production that we talked about, which is made in the liver when we eat carbs. And that can lead to problems with fatty liver um, or weight issues. And, and the common sign of that is just feeling really sleepy after the meal, like you got to lie down on the couch after the meal. So it's not good to have low blood sugar either. You want to you wanna try to strike a balance and, and listen to your body and come to um, you know, let your body tell you what, what is good. Um, so um, if, if we do maintain too much of that low blood sugar tendency or blood sugar swinging, then by the time a young woman gets to menopause, for example, she can have a lot of hormonal problems because when the ovaries stop producing hormones, the adrenals have to take over. And if the adrenals are stressed from making cortisol all the time because the blood sugar's low, um, then, then they're not really gonna make hormones very well. They're not going to have a good reserve. So, um, so here's a couple scenarios here. Low blood sugar is not great for hormones for women um, because it leads to increased cortisol. And if you're always making cortisol, you don't have the raw materials you need to balance progesterone. And so most women will get to a progesterone estrogen imbalance. Um, similarly, high blood sugar can kind of lead to the same outcome, can lead to a lot of hormonal problems, but through a different pathway because the high blood sugar prompts insulin and the more insulin there is, then the higher the estrogen gets. So, we want to avoid this common cycle, maybe where breakfast is skipped and the person is just drinking a cup of coffee, which is a pretty strong stimulant and not really providing many other nutrients. There's no fat, there's no protein in that coffee. Um, and then maybe at lunch, having a highly allergenic food like the bagel with the wheat and a lot of carbohydrate is really just perpetuating this blood sugar, which is probably swinging a lot 
throughout the day. So that finally at the end of the day, she's just got to have her sweet because the body is so undernourished. So I tend to think of when people um, come to talk to me and say, you know, I have a lot of cravings. I'm just addicted to sugar. I know I want to stop, but I'm not sure like how to get this done. I say, well, the sugar craving is a sign that your body's undernourished. So you need to start nourishing your body and you need to eat the things that are most nourishing. And then your body's not going to ask for this emergency food, which is the sugar. So, so it's good. You are listening to your body. You need to listen to that message, but you need to respond differently. So I'm a fan of the paleo diet. There are certainly many dietary approaches that work for people, but I like the paleo diet because of its emphasis on, um, you know, carbohydrates that are not inflammatory. So there's no grains, especially minimal beans um, or legumes. And, um, and there's good sources of protein. So whether or not that's fish or seafood or bison or some other kind of meat, that can be really helpful for providing the neurotransmitters for making hormones um, and, and also getting enough good fat and good vegetables. So that's a good place to start um, in terms of just a model for the diet. So my first tip for addressing sugar cravings is to eat fat. So if you have a sugar craving or any kind of craving, you know, craving for bread or whatever, um, instead of going for that treat, eat some fat instead. So here's some examples like coconut oil, olives, eggs, nuts, um, bacon, I mean, whatever fat you like, um, assuming that it's not highly processed vegetable oil, like I would avoid corn oil and soy oil um, and most of the processed vegetables, all of the processed vegetable oils. Um, so try eating that. Try eating a few bites of fat. Avocados might be another one. Um, the next time you've got a craving. And I think you, if you haven't tried this, you might be surprised that it's pretty helpful. And maybe you've just got to have some kind of a treat. You can make a fat treat instead of a sugar treat. So you can buy these things called keto cups, which you can see on the bag, coconut butter, cacao, cacao butter, MCT oil, which is a form of coconut oil, um, and monk fruit, which is a alternative sweetener that's, that I like. I think it's pretty healthy. You can also make these. The keto cups can be a little pricey, although they're convenient. So you can just Google fat bomb. Um, so I just found this one. Um, you know, this is probably like coconut oil and some alternative sweetener like stevia or monk fruit, um, xylitol, something like that and um, maybe chocolate, but you can make them in other flavors too. So this is nice if you're somebody that, you know, it's not just about um, eating something to make the craving stop. Maybe you really want to feel like you're treating yourself. Um, that can be a nice alternative. And if you're not familiar with alternative sweeteners, you should experiment and get to know them and, you know, see which ones you like. I'm a fan of the monk fruit extract on the left because um, it's good for people who have food sensitivities. Um, some of the alternative sweeteners can aggravate people more. Um, so monk fruit's a pretty safe one and it doesn't really have an aftertaste like the stevia on the right definitely has kind of a noticeable um, stevia-like taste. If you're buying these alternative sweeteners, definitely read the label because a lot of the, especially like those powdered <clears throat> sweeteners you'll find packets of in the store, um, they'll, the first ingredient sometimes is corn and then the second ingredient will be stevia. And you don't want that because um, <clears throat> corn can be very aggravating and kind of actually perpetuate sugar cravings for people. Um, there's many other ones out there. Allulose is a new one um, that's getting popular on the market, um, and that, that can be okay. Um, xylitol um, is another one, but as an um, alcohol, it can be hard on the digestive system. So I would just suggest experimenting with these different things. Um, you probably don't want to go whole hog into maple syrup or honey or something like that just to replace sugar. 
um, because those are still going to be high glycemic and aren't really going to help with balancing your overall blood sugar level. So it's, it's best to um, maybe consider something um, without sugar at all in it. The second tip is to eat adequate proteins. This is a picture of some salmon as an example of a, a protein to eat. I would suggest a protein with every meal, a protein like salmon or shrimp or you know um, poultry or red meat, grass-fed, free range. Um, this really helps a lot with stabilizing blood sugar levels. Because again, when the body's got cravings, it's undernourished. And so you want to think about fat, and you want to think about protein, because these are the stuff that nourish your endocrine system and your nervous system um, and, and um, will help a lot with overcoming those cravings. You also want to think about eating three meals a day. So don't skip a meal if you struggle with uh, cravings. Eat a protein, eat a fat, and avoid some common allergens because some of the common allergens can be so hard to digest that they set up an unhealthy gut environment and set up unhealthy cycles of cravings. So these are the top six sugar, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and peanut. Uh, eggs are the seventh, so be aware that those are sometimes an allergen. I tend to not include them. We live in, in Madison, we live in a place where we can get a lot of really good eggs, soy-free eggs. So I don't usually see eggs being as big of a problem. Um, but, but all of these foods are um, difficult to digest and sugar, sugar just, you know, sets up um, the insulin production, which leads to the inflammation. And the other foods have such large uh, protein structure at a molecular level that they're very aggravating and they set up uh, dysbiosis or imbalance in the gut flora. So you want to get these foods out of the diet, at least initially, um, and generally long term, it's good to, to avoid these foods. The next tip is to eat more salt. So salt's actually, uh, sea salt especially, is a great source of minerals. And the blood sugar level follows the mineral level. So I usually find when I'm talking to people who have cravings or have blood sugar difficulty that they need a lot of help with their minerals. So whether that's sodium or magnesium or potassium, calcium. And um, unfortunately, we've been kind of brainwashed in this culture to avoid salt, but salt is essential and can really help with nourishment because uh, the body basically needs electrolytes, it needs salt. I have a whole webinar on salt, so maybe we'll, if there's interest, we'll, we'll do that down the road. But one thing that's interesting about salt is when you look at populations around the globe who don't restrict salt and haven't received any messaging that's negative about salt, they all tend to eat about two teaspoons of salt a day. So if you've been somebody who's restricted salt, you know, that might be a good goal to start working towards. Um, studies show that salt is very stress reducing. Um, so this is a big study done with women and they found that women who ate high amounts of sodium were less depressed than other women. And this makes a lot of sense because salt is key for the nervous system and also key for responding to stress. So instead of responding to stress by eating sugar, I would suggest, you know, choosing some high salt foods. Olives, for example, would combine fat and salt. Um, you can also just, you know, salt your soup, salt your eggs, um, salt, uh, make an electrolyte drink with lemon juice and salt. This is my favorite salt, Baja Gold Sea Salt. It's um, just the highest in all the trace elements and minerals and has a lot of good um, natural uh, metabolites in it. Um, so I have this available on my website and, and here at my office. So that, that's a good one. Celtic salt is a good close second. The next tip is greens. So greens are kind of like salt in that they're very high in minerals and they can also have a bitter flavor, which can really help curb cravings. 
So you can get a green powder, which is what the BioRaculous on the right is an example of. This is a powder that I have on my web so, uh, on the web store. Um, but you can find powders like that in the grocery store too. Just you know, look at the label and make sure that they're clean and free of the allergens and low in sugar. Um, you can also make yourself green juice by juicing celery, wheat, grass, cucumbers. Um, you can also eat um, like greens, like dandelion. Um, dandelion leaves, for example, are a good bitter that's really healthy. Uh, violets, uh, you can eat violet leaves. Um, so this can be really helpful. I like to suggest having a green drink when it's like maybe four or five o'clock and you're hungry and you're transitioning from your daily activities maybe to the evening activities and can't quite make it to dinner. I think there's a tendency for a lot of people to be experiencing some adrenal stress because our cortisol naturally kind of plummets in that time of the afternoon or just a blood sugar drop. And so the green drink can really help tide you over to make a healthy dinner and eat that healthy dinner rather than like getting into the chips or whatever it is you get into uh, when you get home um, or are home now <laughs> in our situation. So um, tip number six is optimizing digestion. So there are many steps for this, but um, the first one I want to talk about is healthy bacteria. So we know from research studies that our cravings actually come from bacteria in the gut. For example, people that like chocolate have a specific bacteria that the people that don't like chocolate don't have. And so we think that's why some people like chocolate and some people don't. So one tool that can be really helpful when you're trying to, when you are cutting out sugar, is to take a high dose probiotic. And by high dose, I mean like over 100 billion. So the Proker is probably the highest available dose that you can buy without a prescription on the market. And it's, it's a trillion critters. So it's like taking a whole bottle in a dose. And the probiotic on the right is 225 billion. Pretty good, but not nearly as high as the Proger. Uh, but I found they, you know, um, they can work well in different situations, but they, they, both, they both work well. So you don't necessarily have to buy the highest um, level probiotic to get results. But that can really help a lot um, just to make sure you've got a good high dose probiotic in your routine to keep you away from sugar because a lot of the cravings are probably coming from dysbiosis or imbalance in the bacteria in the gut. And this keeps it normalized and helps make sure you're digesting your food well. The next part of optimizing digestion is to make sure you've got good digestive secretion. So making acid in the stomach is really important. Having um, enough enzymes from the pancreas and so sometimes we need help with this. The orthodigestzyme is a supplement that combines support for the stomach, for the enzymes, and for the liver. So that's why I like that one. It's kind of like a three-in-one digestive support um, to make sure you're breaking down all your food and you're detoxifying the gut. And um, the apple cider vinegar can also be a very accessible remedy that helps improve digestion too. You can just take uh, a teaspoon or a tablespoon in four to eight ounces of water and sip that either with the meal or away from the meal um, to help with stimulating the stomach acid and the bile flow. And the bile flow liver support would be the next part of, of optimizing digestive secretions because if you want to nourish your body, you want to break your food down well and you want to have a meal and digest the meal without there being a lot of fermentation and digestive dysfunction from the different organisms in the gut. And so to do that, you've got to have strong digestive secretions. So things that help the liver are more fat, because more fat moves bile, and bile helps digest your meal. Um, bitter herbs like dandelion, yellow dock, trifola, bitter greens I mentioned, like dandelion greens are a good example, but really any, any deep green. Um, Beets are another good one, and salt is helpful at moving bile. 
And then the last piece of optimizing digestion is making sure that someone doesn't have leaky gut. Sometimes somebody who's really struggling with cravings or blood sugar crashes has what's called leaky gut, um, which is the topic of another webinar, but essentially the gut is one cell, cell layer thick and it can become broken down from vitamin D deficiency, different stressors, medications, eating foods, uh, the allergenic foods, um, aging, pregnancy, I mean, you name it, glyphosate, which is the roundup in um, all the non-organic food now. Um, this all breaks down the gut lining and then, um, and then that causes a whole number of issues with digestion. So we wanna seal up that gut um, so that we're really getting the healthiest gut environment. And to do that, to repair leaky gut, I typically work one-on-one -on -one with people on a special food program and then supplements that help seal the gut. So here's an example of some of those. The Ione Biome is a great supplement that helps improve the microbial community and how it communicates in the gut. And um, L-glutamine is another popular one that helps improve the functioning of the cells in the gut lining. Probiotics, we already talked about. Vitamin D uh, is very important at, at keeping the integrity of the gut. Liposomal glutathione is an antioxidant you can take in a supplemental form that, that keeps the gut from getting leaky. And then enzymes are also really helpful, at just making sure food's getting broken down and not aggravating the gut lining to make it leaky. So moving on from digestion, another thing that can be really helpful is just practicing self-awareness. And for some people, keeping a food log is helpful for this. So if you're writing down what you're doing, it's um, easier to be conscious about what it is. And then you can really see if the choices you're making are in line with your values. Uh, and then if you're trying to reassert your values, like, okay, I want to feed my body nourishing food uh, so that I attain whatever the goal is, I feel good, then, um, you know, then it's a little easier to see, oh, you know, I'm making these choices and they're not really aligned with this value that, I, that I'm working on. Um, and, and that can make it easier to just be more mindful and make better choices in the moment, too. Um, and then at the end of all of this, sometimes there's root issues that are, um, that need to be addressed so that a person feels more in balance. So you can do functional blood chemistry, which is the type of work that I do with people where I look at your, uh, blood levels and look at them very differently than a medical doctor would. I'm looking for what's really optimal, um, for a nutritional status. So maybe some electrolytes are off or your iron stores are off or you're not digesting your protein well or there's a need for detoxification. Um, sometimes if there's dysbiosis in the gut, doing a stool test called a GI map can be very valuable to see um, you know, what exactly is happening in the gut and how do we get over that so we can get back into balance. The adrenal stress index is another test that can be really helpful in a case where a person's trying to um, overcome sugar cravings and dealing with a lot of the different issues around blood sugar control. And this is a, a panel that adrenal stress index is basically a, a home saliva test where you test all your different adrenal hormones. And this is one of the um, things that it it comes out with for cortisol. So it checks your cortisol throughout the day. We've got these four data points, but basically the blue would be the test result and the green is what a healthy cortisol level should be. So it should be this nice downhill ski slope. So for this person, for example, the cortisol level is fairly low, um, especially in the morning, we almost would call this flat line and so this person would probably struggle with energy and probably have some blood sugar difficulties. Um, and so it can be really helpful to see what the adrenal hormones are doing so that we can, I can suggest adrenal supplements or herbs. Um, and so that could be another underlying issue that when you address that issue, it just becomes so much easier to have the energy to make these healthy meals and make better decisions. Um, around taking care of ourselves. So sometimes that's instrumental. 
So to summarize, we talked about, you know, there's <clears throat> a lot of problems that stem from, from sugar and, you know, our tolerance for sugar is much better typically when we're younger and as we age we get more insulin resistant and so that's why it's important as we age to um, reduce the amount of carbohydrates that we eat especially as we get um, as we get older and if we're more prone to cognitive issues then we need to be thinking about switching from the carbohydrate based diet that's pretty standard in america to um, to a more fat based diet thinking about low carb uh, vegetables um, a, as you know, our source of fiber rather than higher carb things like sweet potatoes, you know, would be pretty high carb. Um, I think I got off on a tangent there, but um, then we talked about some of the underlying imbalances that contribute to cravings and those really lead into, you know, um, what to do about them. So eating more fat. So don't forget the next time you have a craving, try eating a few spoonfuls of fat, any kind of fat that you like that's healthy. Um, try to eat protein consistently at every meal. So, so for a woman, um, a minimum of 65 grams of protein would be, you know, what you need if you're not physically active, if you're just sitting all day. Um, so that's, that's about a palm-sized serving of protein at every meal. And avoiding the common allergens. We talked about eliminating gluten and corn and soy, peanut, things like that. Increasing your salt, increasing your greens, maybe thinking about having a green powder or a green drink if you have like a trouble time during the day that leads into sugar cravings. Um, considering things that help with healthy digestion so that you're really getting better nourish from your meals and you're making sure you're balancing that gut environment that can lead to cravings. And then perhaps considering a food log or food diary, some kind of awareness practice around what you're eating. And, um, and then also maybe considering doing some more advanced testing to see if you need to tweak or optimize anything. So, I am open now, I'm available for phone consultations. Um, I do offer a body tune-up tune -up workshop on an annual basis, um, usually in the fall. And this is, I just wanted to bring that up for this talk because it's a nice way to make dietary changes and make the changes I'm talking about in a group environment. Uh, I haven't um, set the plan yet for the body tune-up, it, it may be, an online workshop this year. So if anybody's interested in that, you know, express interest to me and you can help. Um, and that's all I've got tonight. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But thank you very much for listening. Hi, that was, that was so fascinating. I just have a quick question. Sure. Is Kombucha tea count as a kind of probiotic you'd want to be taking? And then if so, how much kombucha tea? And yeah, I tend to drink it late in the afternoon. Um, instead of eating a snack, like before dinner, I, I'll have some. But I don't know if that counts as enough of a probiotic or if I should be drinking it first thing in the morning or to clean, clean out my gut or what would you suggest? Thank you. Well, that's a good question. I think for most healthy individuals, some kombucha in moderation is fine. But um, the problem with kombucha, in my mind, especially if we're talking about addressing blood sugar control or sugar cravings, is that the SCOBY is an organism that actually digests and kind of thrives on sugar. And it can be hard to know what kind of critters you're getting in the kombucha. So since most kombucha is made through the digestion of sugar, uh, you wanna be kind of careful that it isn't just adding critters to your gut that are signaling you to consume more sugar. Um, 
And so that, that may not be an issue for some individuals, but I typically would tell someone to, at least in the beginning of trying to make a, a dietary shift to maybe limit kombucha. Um, and, and if you're wanting the probiotic, I would have the pro, I would get a standardized probiotic. Um, so yeah, there can sometimes okay. be where the kombucha is, is setting up more cravings for people. And you want the bacteria that you want in the gut like to digest vegetables primarily <laughs> fermented vegetables so if you're into ferments i'd probably go more for fermented vegetables to try to optimize that than kombucha at least initially until you kind of feel like yeah i got this and everything's all in balance now <clears throat> okay thank you so much welcome let's see there was another question uh um how long does it take for our bodies to stabilize blood sugar when eating a low sugar diet? How can we try to introduce sugary items back into our diet? Heard you should not eat sugary items when on a low sugar diet because it can damage cells. Well, um, maybe we should do the ketogenic webinar. <laughs> um, thinking about doing that one, but basically if you're gonna be on a low sugar diet, you need to be on a high fat diet because if you just try to cut back on sugar without providing calories from another energy source, your body's probably not gonna like that. I mean, maybe there are some individuals with a constitution who just, it wouldn't matter, but most of us, um, if, you, if you don't provide calories from other foods, um, then you're not going to be very successful at maintaining the dietary change because the body's just going to be screaming for fuel. And I know that wasn't your question, but so the question is then, let's say you were on a low sugar diet and you were getting lots of good fats. How can you try to introduce sugary items back into the diet? Um, so, I mean, ultimately, you an ideal might be more of like a paleo diet for someone going from maybe a ketogenic diet to occasionally eating paleo i wouldn't necessarily suggest going back to sugar ever just because of all the problems it creates um, but let's say yeah we were talking about maybe going from um, a keto diet to maybe trying to eat more carbs there's many different nutrients that affect how our bodies respond to carbohydrates. So you can improve that by exercising more. And there's actually a good book called um, Keto for Women. And she has a chapter or two about how to cycle carbohydrates into the diet. So that might be a good resource for you. Um, <clears throat> And you might also want to think about if, if you struggle when you try to have um, natural sources of carbohydrates. Um, some of that may just be, you know, where your body is at, but sometimes that can be a sign that there's some kind of deficiency, like a zinc deficiency or B12 or vitamin D or chromium. And so that can be tested in a, a micronutrient panel. Let's see, I think we had a couple other questions here. When I'm referring to reducing sugar, am I including whole fruit as well? Should we try to reduce the amount of whole fruit we eat too? That's a great question. I think this is a really individual question. Depends on the person and what's happening with them and what their goals are. Usually I would say in general to avoid tropical fruit because it's very, very high in sugar. So a lot of tropical fruit all the time probably isn't good for anybody. The body, we know from, from studies that the body can handle about a maximum of 30 grams of fructose a day, which is I think about one banana or maybe two small apples. So if someone's um, maybe trying to get off sugar and wants to use fruit, I think that's fine. But the ultimate goal should be to keep that fructose intake to one to two pieces of fruit a day. Now, some people with blood sugar problems are gonna have dysfunction if they eat fruit. Um, you know, if they eat more than, uh, you know, 20 to 30 grams of carbs a day, they have dysfunction. And that's the type of person who will probably really love a fat-based diet. So I think it depends on the person. If, if you're 
including some fruit and still finding that you're not satiated between meals and you're sleeping, it, sleep is off or you know any of those other indicators I was talking about, um, that might be a sign that taking the fruit out would be a good thing for you. Whereas other people might have much better tolerance for the fruit and may not need to, to have um, a low fruit diet. So I think it really depends on the person. And then someone says, thank you. Okay, more of those topics I mentioned. Yeah, so I said, you know, if people are interested, maybe we can do a, a salt talk and a keto fat paste talk. I think maybe I'd like to try to do the thyroid talk online too. So I will keep you posted over the summer um, when I'm doing more of the webinars. So thanks everybody. Have a great night.